channel open. Welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show was recorded on February 22nd, 2019, and is current through the Star Trek Discovery Season 2 episode, The Sound of Thunder, so beware of spoilers. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a 30-minute news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. As you know, we are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are four television shows at some stage of production. There is at least one more almost certainly on the way. And we have enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole, which after my visit to Toy Fair this past weekend is getting even fuller. So stick with me and I will help you sort the real facts from a lot of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. But I can't do this alone, and my guest this week is the other co-host of the fabulous Snap Trek podcast, and also my first guest from my homeland of the United Kingdom, Ross Webster. Ross, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. It's a real pleasure to come on to Weekly Trek, and I look forward to talking to you for the next half an hour. Absolutely. I am so excited to have you. So last time Jen teased uh, your episode uh, of Snap Trek that just came out, which compared Children of Time with E Squared. So tell us now, what's the next episode that you guys, or I guess the next two episodes that you guys are going to be comparing? It's a pretty exciting theme for the next episode of Snap Trek. It's kidnapped to be wrestlers. And we are comparing a Voyager episode to some cat say with the classic original series episodes of the Gamesters of Triskelion. <laughs> that is amazing. We, I, was, I think it was Jen's idea, and I was blown away by how clever it was. And the two do compare really nicely. You'll hear the categories when they come through, but there's a definite wrestling theme running through the episode. Oh, amazing. I cannot wait for that. I'm actually a huge fan of Sankatse. I think that it's a really fun episode. When it first came out all those years ago, I didn't know much about wrestling, but I knew who The Rock was. And when The Rock was appearing in my favorite show that I was watching at the time, I was like, wow, people must love this show to get such big celebrities on it. So I was really excited to see him appear. And that, that hasn't diminished. Now he's even more famous. He is. And I think he can attribute his acting chops to his time spent on Star Trek Voyager. He learned a lot. He obviously learned a lot. He certainly did. All right, Ross, I ask my guests this question every week, but I want to know something that you're particularly enjoying about Star Trek at the moment. What's got you moving at Walk 10? I'm a big fan of comic book, and I'm going to choose the IDW comic book series, the Star Trek comics that are being produced. It seems that every month a raft of Star Trek comics are coming out. At the moment, I'm waiting on Transformers versus Star Trek issue five. The Q conflict has just come out, and I'm, I'm looking forward to issue two. They've announced Captain Saru one shots coming out soon. There's the Star Trek year five. They've been teasing some great Tholian artwork came out for that today. IDW have been killing it with Star Trek comics. They push the boundaries of art with storytelling and they, they tie in a lot of different ideas. So actually each comic tells a great story. Some of them really pull you back into the series and you think, wow, this could be an episode in its own right. So it's the IDW comics. Um, I can't stress enough how much I'm enjoying them and how much I think you should go and have a look at them, check them out. Are you a big comic fan? Oh yeah, that's an amazing choice. I am a huge fan of IDW's full line of comics. Uh, the ones that I'm particularly looking forward to, I really enjoyed the first issue of the Q Conflict, mm -hmm. which is one of these things that I've always wanted to see a big crossover between Kirk, Picard, Cisco, Janeway and their crews. Yeah. And so when they announced that, and then it was gonna have a Q and Trelane tie-in. I just think it's amazing. And and the first episode was a lot of setups. So you didn't the crews didn't really meet each other. The competition's all to play out yet as the omnipotent Star Trek beings. Exactly. But I'm so excited for how that's gonna that's gonna play out. And also for the Captain Saru Discovery comic. I think the Discovery comics have been amazing. Mike Johnson and Kirsten Beyer have been doing a really, really fabulous job with those. They have been doing a great job. And I want to shout once more for the Star Trek versus Transformers comic, which is just bringing me back to my childhood because it's drawn in the animated series style and the sort of the classic 80s Transformers style. And the two mesh so well, it really looks like you're watching one of the Saturday morning cartoons. And the fact that the Enterprise becomes a Transformer in its own right, 
my little childhood dream has just been met for me right there. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm looking forward to issue five coming out in a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. They are doing great work. So my pick this week is uh, actually one of the products that I got the opportunity to preview at Toy Fair this last week. So as most of you know, if you don't already, I do some contributing writing for trekcore.com. And I had the opportunity to go with uh, our eponymous editor, Ken Riley, to New York Toy Fair this past weekend and get the opportunity to meet with the licensees and see what products they had coming up this year. And one of my absolute favorites that just tickled me totally was a new game, a new card game coming out from Looney Labs, who are the makers of the Star Trek Flux series of games. It's a different game than the Flux series. It's called Chrono Trek. And it's this kind of card strategy game that includes every single time travel episode of Star Trek, excluding Discovery and uh, the Kelvin timeline. So it, it basically, you lay the cards out, and it has a it, it's it's a chronology of events from the Star Trek timeline, and your time traveling character who wants to change those events and totally reorder the timeline. So on the front of the card is the event and then on the back is what changes and it had carpenter street it had futures end you name it it had all good things in the anti-time anomaly children of time every episode of star trek that had some kind of time piece to it there was some reference to it in this game. And I just thought it was extremely well done. And I think it will be a lot of fun to play once it comes out. It must be so complicated to try and figure out the rules to a game where you're, you're reordering time and then tie it into specific events in a TV show that spanned 50 years. That must have been a work of of sheer genius to make that. Did you have a go? Yeah, yeah. We got a little bit of an opportunity to play. And I will say that the rules to play it were surprisingly simple. You're totally right. I think it would have been so complicated to put it together. And the the, the Looney Labs team are, are real geniuses for having done so. But the game itself actually is quite elegant and obviously much more fun if you're a Star Trek fan because you get all of the references. But it's I think it's the kind of thing you could play with a group of non-fans who would still enjoy playing the game because there is very much sort of a chaotic kind of everybody's got an agenda they're trying to uh they're trying to realize throughout it it looks great i want to shout out to the the, the artwork on the, the deep space nine flux game as well that stylized character art really looks good and i i have a flick through the next generation flux game and the art and that is equally good i really like it um, and I'd love to have a, have a crack at that as well. All right. Well, with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on, and I'm a reporter. So our first story this week is a bit of good news about CBS All Access. This was first reported in the Wall Street Journal, but because I don't have a Wall Street Journal subscription and I don't plan to get one, I'm actually getting all of this information from the trekmovie.com report that wrote up. Uh, what was in the Wall Street Journal article. But it seems like CBS All Access has exceeded its target for subscriptions. So in an earnings call with the current interim CEO of CBS, Joe Ianelio, he was talking about how CBS All Access and Showtime, which are the two CBS streaming services, had already reached their cumulative 2020 goal of achieving 8 million subscribers. And that the split was about 50-50 between All Access and Showtime, which is really exciting. They hit the goal a year early. Um, they've actually set a new ambitious goal for 2022 of reaching 25 million subscribers. And as Ianelio was talking about their plans for the streaming services, he did reiterate uh, that Star Trek was a component of that, obviously with Discovery that's already out, with the Picard show on the way, and then with the uh, three additional TV shows shows that have either been announced or in some level of active production or that we are fairly certain are right around the corner. So I think, you know, obviously there has been a lot of frustration about CBS's decision in the US to place Star Trek Discovery and all of the new Star Trek content onto CBS All Access, with the exception of the announcement that we're anticipating of a Nickelodeon Star Trek kids show. But this, I think, sends a really good signal for the future of Star Trek. Ross, you are lucky enough to be able to watch this on Netflix. But uh, what do you think about this news that CBS All Access has exceeded its subscriber goal? I think it's great that 
they've met their goal. And I think it's obvious that a lot of this comes down to Star Trek. And by them plowing into more shows, that is just them sort of doubling down the idea that they know where the money is and they know what people want to watch. And there's so much buzz around Discovery. It's really apparent that people are interested in it and people that they know where to go to watch it and you're right i am lucky enough to be able to watch on netflix just a few hours after you guys get to watch it but on the other hand that's not to say that they're going to get every show i suppose because we didn't get the short tracks until what the week before discovery season two um uh, premiered on netflix so i'm interested to know how the rest of the world is going to enjoy these tv shows as well particularly nickelodeon because i can't remember the last time i actually watched a nickelodeon show uh, and where I where I would gain access to those kinds of shows from, so I am interested to know where this is going to go. Yeah, and it seems like there is an interest amongst CBS. They've talked about this a little bit in considering launching CBS All Access in the rest of the world, and they have been pretty cagey about you know what the plans are for international broadcast for additional shows beyond Discovery. So I guess it's not outside the realm of possibility. Though obviously there's been you know, no announcements about this that an international release for CBS All Access and that additional Star Trek content would be available on that as opposed to Netflix does not seem unlikely given that I think the corporation you know, wants to create a streaming platform that they can have around the world that can be a rival for you know, Netflix, Amazon Video. Do they have loads of other great stuff that I'll enjoy watching? Am I going to be glad that I move over to CBS All Access in the future? Well, they have this new Twilight Zone show which is coming out. They do have that. I would, I would like to watch that yeah i think i'm pretty excited about that and the stephen king adaptation of the stand or a new adaptation of stephen king's novel the stand i think that also looks pretty pretty interesting so they you know they've got a lot of stuff going on and also planning for what seems like year-round star trek so i mean that's really what i'm there for it's not to be sniffed at if they are going to get year-round star trek I'd, i'd seriously consider accessing if i needed to For sure. Good news out of CBS All Access and good news for its flagship show, Star Trek Discovery, which thanks to internet sleuthing, we have a number of new episode titles for the remainder of season two. As of now, we know the episode titles through uh, episode 11 of season two. So only three episodes left that we don't know the titles for. Um, This is coming from trekcore.com. There are six new titles that have been... Well, they've not been announced, but that uh, thanks to Canadian TV listings, the internet has figured out what they are. That's episode 207, Light and Shadow, which will be next week's episode. 208, If Memory Serves. 209, Project Daedalus. 210, The Red Angel. And 211, Perpetual Infinity. Ross, what do you think these titles tell us about what we can expect from the remainder of Star Trek Discovery Season 2? I have to say, it's hard to know because the titles often don't give the game away or they don't give you too many hints or they're quite esoteric so you were talking about uh this week's episode the sound of thunder and how that might relate to a ray bradbury short story of the same of a similar name actually we don't know where they've got these themes from or these ideas from although there are a few words that are popping out there but particularly project daedalus which could potentially link to the enterprise episode of the same name daedalus i presume the red angel is a is about the red angel which i'm quite looking forward to hearing about and I have to say, I thought the, the, the names Light and Shadows, and if memory serves, sounded very much like TNG-sounding episode titles. Yes. So the first season, they had those much longer titles, and I really I thought they were invoking the original series a little bit more. These ones seem a little bit tighter. But I think it's so hard to say what these titles really mean, apart from The Red Angel. I'm pretty convinced that one's going to be about the Red Angel. That's the really interesting thing about Star Trek Discovery Season 2 as opposed to Season 1, which is that... You know, and, and Ken Riley and I were having a long conversation about this after we were done with our toy fair visits, which is that we just really have no idea where the season is headed. No. It's not like season one where it, because the kind of Vogue Tyler story was fairly obvious from the fact that Jonathan Frakes had let slip that there was going to be a visit to the Mirror Universe. Yeah. That then kind of turned a lot of people onto the Lorca as Mirror Universe mm-hmm. captain, though in full disclosure, I was totally shocked by that when it happened. This episode, we spent nearly two hours trying to discern the identity of the Red Angel and never came up with anything that felt particularly like we'd hit an aha moment. So I'm super excited, uh, which I think is great because I, I like not knowing where things are going. Um, and I also like the fact that these 
titles don't necessarily tell us too much. I'd love it if the Project Daedalus title was a tie-in to the Enterprise episode Daedalus, and there is a little Easter egg in the Discovery opening credits. They show the transporter, and just down in the corner, it says something like, invented by Emery Erickson, which is a callback to that episode. And I yeah. also like the fact that we may get these answers about who the Red Angel is before the end of the season, I think that'd be really exciting. So, But I, one thing I think Discovery has done really well is the titles for the episodes. I mean, things like An Obol for Charon, Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad, The Wolf Inside. They have really put a lot of time and, and effort into figuring out what these titles should be. And they're so evocative. They are. And I think the meaning actually can be explored afterwards. You think, okay, I'm seeing where these names are coming from. But actually, before you get there, it's so hard to see what these could mean. Mm -hmm. I am really looking forward to finding it. Because you're right to say that episode 210 is the Red Angel. And that makes me think that that mystery is going to get solved earlier. And actually, then the, the problem, perhaps the Red Angel idea is they're going to be expanded upon a bit more and we're really going to find out not just who the person is or what the person is but what are they trying to do and what do we need to do to help them or stop them it really is quite exciting extremely yeah i am i'm all in on this season uh, i think it's been great so far i had some issues with the sounds of thunder but overall this season has been really really strong and i'm i'm fully behind and excited about how it plays out but speaking of discovery let's dive into the last two episodes so as we mentioned last episode we recorded actually about half an hour before saints of imperfection premiered so uh, marty and i did not get much of an opportunity to really talk about any of the coverage around the return of wilson cruz as dr culver so wanted to talk about that this week and then we have another story option after but first of all there's been a lot of press that Anthony Rapp and Wilson Cruz have done around the return of Hugh Culver in Saints of Imperfection. Uh, one interview I picked out for us to talk about on this show is they did an interview with The Hollywood Reporter. And, and one of the things I thought was really interesting in the interview was, okay, now Culver is back, sort of a, a, a little bit of a hint of what to expect from the rest of the season, which we saw start to play out mm -hmm. in the sound of thunder of Culber kind of not feeling terribly comfortable in this new body. But there was this one quote that I thought was really interesting, which was that they were talking about how this season we'll get to see more of who Culber is as a person, not just as a component of the Stamets and Culber relationship. And we'll get to learn more about who he is and what his motivations are beyond just he is the partner of Stamets, uh, which I think is is great because I think, you know, we did not get to spend a lot of time with the character in season one. And it's really exciting that we'll get to spend more time with him in season two, especially now he's a series regular and learn a bit more about who he is when he's not with Hugh. But Ross, what did you pick out about this interview that you particularly resonated with? It, it's a strange one because Culver has really... I don't want to say come alive, but he, his character has become much more interesting post his death as we sort of think about what that means for the stories we've read and also the immediate out, you know, the immediate announcement that he was going to be, he was definitely going to come back and be reborn. And so you think, well, why is that going to happen? How is it going to happen? So much speculation, so much discussion. And they, they mention that in this interview here as well, that he knew he was coming back, but perhaps he wasn't entirely sure in what capacity he was coming back and for how long he was coming back. And they told him that he did, he was going to come back in that season. And indeed, he did come back because we found him in the in the network. I think, I think it was the next episode that Stamets finds him tucked away in the network and uh, Colbert helps guide him out. But really, really interesting to see that this all has been a long game, that they they knew this was going to happen and they knew it was coming back. And Anthony Rapp and Wilson Cruz are so committed to these characters and this idea. They, they really are so excited to be the first LGBTQ couple on Star Trek. And they really want to they really want to make this work and to make it a really important thing that we're all going to be thinking about for a long time. So their enjoyment of the playing these characters comes through in this article. And also the little hints about, yeah, we don't know what Culp is going to do and we don't really know how this has affected him, which I think is great because Star Trek often will leave something behind. Discovery can't be accused of that. Discovery is always moving forward and taking these new ideas with them. And I love the idea that Culber has been through an experience which has radically changed him potentially. How is this going to affect him and what are we going to see happen in the future? It's an exciting time. It's very exciting. And then shifting to this week's episode, 
StarTrek.com just today actually published a sort of behind the scenes guide that was put together by the writers of the episode, Bo Yun Kim and Erica Lippolt, who are also going to be the showrunners for the new Section 31 show. Uh, they wrote this episode and they were also on set for the filming and production of it. So they put together this really nice kind of picture guide of their experience uh, of the production of shooting, because uh, there were lots of on location shots in this episode of the uh, of Kaminar, and then lots of new kind of concepts for the Ba'ul, for the Ba'ul ships, for the Ba'ul appearance. And I just thought this was really nice, just like we talked about Olotande Osun Samni's uh, behind the scenes guide for Point of Light. This also has lots of really nice little vignettes in it about, about the shooting of The Sound of Thunder. Ross, anything that stood out to you in this one? When they talk about the design of the Ba'ul technology, I thought that would stand out in the episode. I thought the consistency of it and the stylization of it was a real treat. And they go into some concept drawings of what the battle monoliths could have looked like and some features they could have had, like quite long spider's legs. They could have marched around being quite tripod-like. And I thought that was great. And you see a little bit of that in the, the ships that are in orbit. They have these sort of arms that extend. But it really looks quite creepy on the ground. I can imagine that would have been quite expensive to produce. And also another aspect of the article, which is great, is just how much detail I go into. There's an entire Ba'ul alphabet here at the bottom, which I just absolutely love. The fact they've gone to the trouble of constructing this gorgeous alphabet and then considering how it would be written. I want, it makes me want to go back and look through and see, well, where have I seen these Ba'ul letters? You know, when have I seen something written down? I know I've seen a few when Saru is writing his messages. Is there anywhere else? If I look in the Bible there, do we see anything written down? Is there any other text? It just looks beautiful. And the fact they've gone to this much trouble, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's really great. And the Baul kind of ship design was really unique. Uh, can't wait for Eagle Moss to make their version of it as part of the Star Trek Discovery collection, as I'm sure they will. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and I guess speaking of products, that's a good way for us to segue to Trek Corps coverage of Toy Fair. There were met lots of different licensees. If you go on trekcore.com, you can find four stories about the various different licensees. Just a couple of things I wanted to pick out from that. And then Ross, if there was anything that stood out to you too. First, I was actually a little disappointed about the lack of Star Trek Discovery merchandise. I mean, we're moving into, you know, we're midway through the second season of the show. We don't yet really have a significant amount, you know, there are no Discovery action figures yet. There hasn't really been a huge amount of product on that. I, I got the sense from talking to the licensees that that was starting to change, but they didn't have anything. There wasn't a huge amount at Toy Fair aside from the QMX Enterprise badges. Factory Entertainment are doing a small Star Trek Discovery phaser uh, replica. I love that phaser. That phaser looks great. Yeah, it does look great. And they were talking about wanting to do all of the various different phases from Star Trek, which would be very cool to have all these little little phases uh, stood up in a line as part of an armory. Absolutely. So there was that. And then, you know, the other thing, I know everybody's very curious about McFarlane Toys, who made this big splash at Star Trek Las Vegas two years ago, talking about how they had the license, they were planning, they had an aggressive plan, including making Star Trek Discovery action figures. They did release this past summer, Captain Kirk and Captain Picard figures. And that, they look amazing, those figures. They look really good. Yeah, and there had been plans to do a Star Trek Discovery phaser that disappeared at the last moment. It does seem like that project was cancelled as a result of some of the legal restrictions in the US now around imitation firearms. Uh. Yeah, so that was disappointing. But despite the fact that it's been quiet from McFarlane, aside from those two figures, they did say they are still in the Star Trek business. They are still exploring options and talking to their retail partners about possible additional releases. So they're not done. Um, and obviously it's not the update that we'd like because we'd like to see there's going to be a 15-figure line of from all the shows. I mean, that's what I want, certainly. McFarlane do such beautifully designed figures. We've seen examples of those last year. It would be great to just produce a few more, especially of the more unusual-looking characters, which they really excel at. You know, some of the really unusual species. That would be so exciting to see them uh, create those for us. 
Exactly. So I've got my fingers crossed. We will continue to see more from McFarlane. But but Ross, out of the out of the coverage of Toy Fair, was there anything that particularly stood out to you? I think it would be remiss of us not to mention Bendy Picard. Of course, uh, yes. <laughs> one, I think it looks it look it's quite a good likeness for the uniform, and not a terrible likeness for his head, except for the eyes. Yeah, except for the eyes. <laughs> he looks a bit like. He looks a bit like he's been hit in the head with something. Yes, he looks like he's seen some things and he cannot forget them. <laughs> um, but it's, it's just such a weird idea. I'm just trying to think, if I owned one of these, what would I do with it? And probably I'd give it to one of my friends as a joke, for like, happy birthday, I've got you a bendy Picard. I'm just trying to think, where would I, would I put it on my desk? I'd wrap it around a mug on my desk or something? It's just such a weird idea. I do love it. And I think of all the things, I would definitely think I'd like to try and get one of these, a Bendy Picard. A Bendy Picard in a season one TNG uniform. Do you know what? I did not notice that, but you're absolutely right. Uh huh. He's wearing the season one uniform. Who does that? He's uniform. He's not wearing that uniform in the packet. He's wearing a different uniform. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, the, it, it, it's, in, it's an incredible product. And I can only hope there is a red uniform bendable Geordie and a red uniform bendable season one Worf on yeah. the as well. Of all the characters, you think they could do an Odo. You get a bendable Odo. I think that would make sense. That would be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> but a bendable Picard, I don't know. It's baffling. It's brilliant. I want one. Me too. All right. We've talked about the facts, so now it's time to move to the fun part. You make some very good points, Captain. But it's still all speculation and theory. As always, time for a bit of speculation, a wish, a theory about what's happening on Discovery, about what's coming up on Picard, about what's going on with the Kelvin timeline. So each week I and my guests get a theory about what we think or want to see. So Ross... Give me a theory for this week. Okay, I'm going to be really boring and talk about the big mystery of the time, which is who or what is the Red Angel? Oh, no, this is perfect. Let's do it. Let's get into it. Is it the Iconians? Is it a future guy from Enterprise? Tell me, what do you think? I think, and this is going to sound lame, I think it is Michael Burnham. I I honestly think she is going to, at some point, travel into the future, gain technology, She's going to come back and set set things right that have once went, once went wrong. <laughs> that, this is what's going to happen. As, as soon as I saw the Red Angel appear in uh, The Sounds of Thunder, I was like, if I squint, that could be the shape of Michael Burnham with wings. That That's where my money is on this. It's Michael Burnham. I don't know how it happens. I don't know why it happens. And I still don't really understand what she said to Spock that made him so cross. Or not cross, made him leave. He wasn't cross. Um, that was that. That's not the thing he does. But I am convinced that that is Michael Burnham in that suit. Well, when you say putting right what once went wrong, I mean my mind automatically goes to it being a time traveling Jonathan Archer. I I would love that. I would love them to have gone so deep into the unsolved aspects of Star Trek lore that that is what they come out with as the answer. And that it's a subtle quantum leap crossover. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's what she's doing. Somebody, she, I'm already presuming it's her. The Red Angel is going back in time and solving things that should have been solved. I think that's part of the reason why Pike was so willing to abandon General Order 1 in favour of the crazy evolution plan. Uh, because it's like, well, if the Red Angel has set us here, and they haven't set us wrong yet, so let's solve this problem. I think you're right. The the one thing I keep coming back to on the Red Angel is that it doesn't feel to me like it's true to Discovery's spirit for the Red Angel to be something from outside of the very specific Discovery mythos, which is why I don't think it's the Iconians, because there hasn't really been anything about the Iconians on the show. It would have been teased. It would be such a left field idea. Right. I don't think it's, I don't think we're revisiting the Temporal Cold War. So I'm sorry to your co-host, Jen Tift, who I know really wants an answer to who Future Guy was, but I don't think it's Future Guy. I want that answer. I want that answer too. Oh, absolutely. And if you look at the screen caps from the Sound of Thunder, the Red Angel does seem to have a female form. Uh, so it would not surprise me to find out that it's Michael Byrne. I mean, ultimately, she is the lead character for the show. And this Red Angel has some deep connection to Spock, which Burnham does too. So yeah, I think you are probably 
right on the money. And if I had to guess where knowledge about a time traveling angel suit came from, well, this week we, we had them looking through the information that was downloaded from the sphere in which they got the solution to this problem. So maybe the technical specifications for a time travel suit are also held within the sphere knowledge that they downloaded from a noble for care on. Potentially. No oh, crumbs. I hadn't thought of that, yes. So my theory this week is big picture discovery. And it's actually not so much a theory as I happened upon an Instagram post, which has made me think that production on Star Trek Discovery season three is, even though we've not had an official word about a season three pickup, already underway. Ooh. So I follow Bo Yun Kim on Instagram and I happened to be scrolling through my Instagram stories and she had a picture up, a selfie, in which she indicated it was the last day of hiatus, which, so you write a TV show, you write a season of a TV show, they let you have a break for a little while and then you go back and write the next season and the break in between is the hiatus. So if, if and I think it was Monday was the last day of hiatus, that meant Tuesday was the first day back in production. We know Bo Yun Kim is on the Star Trek Discovery writers, writing staff. She's also one of the showrunners for the new Section 31 show. But Heather Caden, the executive producer of Discovery, said that Bo Yun Kim and Erica Lippolt would be doing double duty in season three while they're producing the Section 31 show also remaining in the Discovery writers' room. So my theory is that a Season 3 pickup is impending and that production on Season 3 of Discovery is already underway, even though we don't know about it officially yet. That is a great theory. I would love there to be some official confirmation in the next couple of weeks that production has definitely begun. And then they can start slipping us those juicy teaser images of things that may or may not be happening in Season 3. Uh, yeah, I, I'd love to. I'd love to hear that. That uh, yours isn't a theory, but in fact a fact. It's about time. I mean, the first season they announced the second season pickup after the fifth episode. We're now after the sixth episode of season two, so we're right in kind of the bullseye, I think, for an announcement very soon. So, and and especially if they are back at work, there's only so long you can keep that under wraps. So, I'm I'm got, I was hoping it was going to be this week, but I've got my fingers crossed that next week will be the week we discover that Discovery will be back. Very exciting. Do you have a theory or wish for Discovery or the future of the franchise that you'd like to share? Tweet them at me at Weekly Trek, and I might feature your theory in a future episode. Well, that's all we've got time for this episode of Weekly Trek. Ross, tell me, how can people get in contact with you? You can find me on Twitter. Uh, I am Taborg at strtrk1701. Or you can follow my podcast, Snaptrek, at Snaptrek. And you should have followed my advice if you didn't already when we had Jen on the show a few weeks ago to follow Snap Trek. But if you didn't already, you should follow my advice this time and do so and listen to an episode because it is actually a really fabulous Star Trek podcast. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. You can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me at Alexander T. Perry. And if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. If you like our shows, please also consider becoming a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. And very exciting this week, we rolled out a whole host of new perks for listeners, which includes the opportunity to appear on Weekly Trek. So if you head on over to Patreon, if you're interested in providing support, there are lots of new perks, including guesting opportunities on all of our shows that you can take advantage of. So so if you've been waiting, now is the time. And we are so grateful to all of our patrons for their support. That's it for me. That's it for this week. Super looking forward to episode seven next week. Fingers crossed it's finally time that we meet Spark. Um, but until next week, live long and prosper.